Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of the Jabot Podcast. My name is Catherine Rubino, and I'm your host and a senior editor at Above the Law. No matter your practice area, PLI has professional development and ethics training content for you. With hundreds of live and on-demand programs offered each year, you can keep up with your CLE credit and sharpen your skills. Engage by using real-world scenarios while earning credits with interactive, practical programs like the Ethics Game Show. Boost your skills in project management, presentations, contract writing, and more, all with programs tailored to your practice. Visit pli.edu to find programs that work for your schedule, your interests, and your goals. On today's episode of The Jabot, I'm joined by Jacqueline Duval, a partner with New York-based law firm Herrick Feinstein. She's in the ta- tax department and leader of the firm's family office group. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me today. Ashley, I am wearing my Ruth Bader Ginsburg socks oh, in, very good. <laughs> for that. And I also want to show you, I'm knitting this. You can't see because this is obviously not in video, but this is a sweater with Ruth Bader Ginsburg's descent collar. That is amazing. First of all, I'm in awe of anybody who has <laughs> the ability to knit some anything, like a scarf, like a plain, just one piece scarf. But uh, for the listeners, this is a very uh, intricate uh, knitted pattern of the jabot, and it is fantastic. So uh, you also are multi-talented as it turns out. <laughs> well, I think knitting just keeps me sane. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all need a little dose of uh, sort of our reality checks, the things that kind of keep us grounded, especially in pandemic living, which is, has not been the easiest for anyone. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, that is absolutely amazing. Uh, so kind of the first question I'd like to ask on this podcast, um, and I, I think it's because so many folks um, go to law school for different reasons and wind up having very different careers um, than they initially thought that they would. <laughs> uh, so, so I'd like to ask uh, everyone, uh, what were the reasons that you decided to go to law school and, uh, you know, has, has the career that you've charted for yourself kind of lived up to, to the expectations when you first entered law school? It's a, such a great question and like such an easy question to answer and like with a very boring answer because it's not glamorous at all. I had no idea what I wanted to do when I finished college. <laughs> and like a lot of people, I'm like, oh, law school will use up three years of time. I can figure it all out. <laughs> um, so I was a German major and an international relations major. And I went to law school. And interestingly enough, I loved it. I loved everything about law school. And that's an unusual story, I think, for people who get through law school as a professional step that has to be taken. Mm -hmm. But I loved it academically. I loved the people I met. It might have been because I really love my law school, which is Cornell. And I'm still very connected there over the years. It's been um, a really important part of my life. Uh, And I think um, when I got to law school, I met a community of people that I really connected with and Mm -hmm. those connections have lasted my whole career. In fact, actually a couple of my jobs, including Herrick came (laughs) through Cornell law school classmates. That's amazing. Um, I definitely uh, feel very strongly that, I don't know, I graduated and then I had to figure something out (laughs) kind of reason to go to law school, which, which I have to say, listeners, it's not the best reason to go to law school. It sometimes works out. That is definitely true. It's it often works out for folks, but, um, but you might want to have better reasons before you invest <laughs> the, the, it's not it's even the time, definite. the money. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Interestingly, um, I have three kids mm-hmm. and one of them is uh, getting her doctorate in opera, but oh. the other two are lawyers. One is just a first year. And then the, the, my youngest is graduating as a 3L this year. And so weirdly, I also have two lawyer children. <laughs> so, so you're passing it on. <laughs> I wasn't able to talk them out of it, apparently. <laughs> I, I often say that my job at Above the Law is convincing people who say they want to go to law school, but have no idea what it's like to actually be a lawyer to not go to law school. <laughs> I get that. Actually, I feel like part of why I've had such a, like, I've loved my career. And that's also unusual, I think, for a lot of lawyers. And part of it's because I've done five or six different things along the way. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a path that I would have ever been able to mark out at the beginning, but it really ended up being fun and Mm -hmm. challenging. And every step was learning something new. So um, that's part of why I really love being a lawyer. Um, I love that your first 
descriptor in describing your legal career is fun. <laughs> I don't think that's something that happens all that often. <laughs> um, and, and it kind of brings me to, to that bigger question. You know, um, we said it kind of in the intro, you're a tax partner. And I remember when I was in law school or even a summer associated big law firm, and it was like, oh, those tax people, I don't, I don't understand what they do. I just know that we need them. And they're very smart and very good at what they do. Just put them in their office, let them think for a while, and they'll come up with something smart. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how is it was tax something you were always drawn to? How did you sort of find that path? It again was kind of like going to law school. Like, I wish I had like a better answer for you, <laughs> but it was because it was hard and the kind of hardest thing you could do. And as a young girl growing up, I wasn't pretty. I wasn't thin. I had brains. And that was what I always was told was the thing that I needed to like focus on. And that was society. And that wasn't, the message I would want to have to give anybody, mm -hmm. but it was what I focused on. And because tax law was hard, I wanted to be good at it. Mm -hmm. And I think tax law is focused on problem solving, right? So if you have to pick a superpower, that would be the one I would, I would like to like showcase. And I'm not really your typical tax lawyer. I mean, I have purple hair, which again, <laughs> your viewers can't see. I can hold a conversation without looking at my feet. Um, but, <laughs> Also, that's also a stereotype that is that, that the nerdy tax lawyer who really uh, has no social skills because as along the way in my career, what I found is that my, I have real friendships around the globe with tax lawyers and they are mm -hmm. some of the most true and loyal friends. They're connected, they're empathic and really deep thinkers and quirky people. And those are people I wanna be with. Mm -hmm. And so once I knew that the tax bar was the bar of people I wanted to be with, it was really easy. Yeah. Yeah. And so that kind of begs the question um, of how would you, or, or, or what are the sort of the, the things that you would give as advice? You know, you said you have two children who are lawyers who are early in their career, trying to find your, your space in the legal profession can be very fraught and, uh, you know, finding where you belong is Oh, can be the difference between enjoying your career and absolutely hating it. Um, so, you know, you said you found the people a, a, in the tax bar were, were where you wanted to be. Um, and But sometimes it's hard to see sort of the, the forest for the trees because you're dealing with a partner at your first job or a group or, you know, there's a third year associate when you're a first year that makes your life miserable and you're just like, I want nothing to do with this kind of law, which is not actually anything to do with the law and everything to do with this particular person. So, so how do you sort of navigate that uh, kind of fraught decision? Such a great question because I think you hit on a number of things, right? One of them is that you can have a concept of what you want to do and what areas you feel like you want to grow in. And then there are just some like realities of people that you interact with that can make or break you. And I think what I would say is figure out what a profession means to you. Like a lot of people go to law school and they have very idealistic views of what they want to do with their career. Mm -hmm. And that's amazing. I didn't have that. I knew that I was going to have student loans and I had, I had my first child during law school. I had bills to pay. Mm -hmm. And so I picked a, a specialty that was difficult, but was also in the world of finance because I knew it was going to be stable for me. Mm -hmm. And then along the way, I, like the idea that if you can pick a specialty in a niche area like tax that makes you um, in demand, you're always going to be able to find a place to use it. Mm -hmm. What I liked about tax law in particular is that because we're problem solvers and we care about how a deal gets done or how a transaction gets fixed, we're often the ones who project manage. And that skill set has really led me over the years to not just be a specialist, but to be an expert generalist, as I call it. <laughs> and being an expert generalist is um, means that you can go into any situation and feel like you can have something to add. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I like about having both a specialty, but a general practice. Mm -hmm. And you started your career in like so many of us do <laughs> in big law, but you didn't really stay in big law. Your career, as you kind of mentioned, has taken a lot of twists and turns um, that have you know, you don't, wouldn't have like a, you don't have a cookie cutter career. Um, so <laughs> it's a crazy map, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's first, first of all, let's work, walk, let's walk our uh, listeners through some of, some of those twists and turns, uh, and also kind of contextualize uh, why you felt like that was the move at the time. 
Yeah, so I really, I really loved speaking about my twisted path. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like a marauder's map of a legal career. Um, but I think what it is is like a lesson in getting up every day and being able to sort of reinvent who we are and what we want to do. Mm-hmm. And I started off. So first, and first of all, like sometimes we get up and reinvent ourselves because we want to, and sometimes mm-hmm. we're forced to, mm-hmm. and sometimes chance comes to us and we grab it. And that's kind of how my career went. So I started off at Cleary Gottlieb in New York, Mm -hmm. and I picked Cleary um, out of law school because it was, it had even 30 years ago, a combination of super liberal values and really excellent smart lawyers. And Mm -hmm. for me, that felt good. And we didn't call it big law back then, (laughs) which makes me feel really old. We also didn't have cell phones, but we (laughs) called it Wall Street Law. Mm-hmm. That was a Wall Street firm. So now I know we call it big law. So Cleary Gottlieb was a great place for me to start. And um, they sent me as a tax lawyer, as a tax associate to London and to the London office where I was uh, with an amazing jumping off point for me because I was able to stay and work in London for over a decade. Wow. And I raised my kids there. I moved out of the law firm into investment banking there. And I was first um, in-house for Morgan Mm -hmm. Stanley um, as their U.S. tax lawyer in London, where I covered in-house tax legal issues, so Mm -hmm. the firm's tax position, but also covered issues that the businesses and the investment and the trading desks had. And that actually led me to move out of being a lawyer and into investment banking. And I went to sit um, at at Goldman Sachs on the derivatives trading desk. And I wasn't a lawyer there. I was working as a structurer. And I could only sort of say that working on the desk with those uh, traders who are derivative structurers was like working with rocket scientists. I mean, they were amazing people. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was fundamentally career changing because it showed me that the skills that I had developed early in my career were ones of confidence and really feeling like I could learn anything. And Mm -hmm. that meant that I had was able to be expert in other areas as well. And um, I was there for a couple of years and I loved it. But then I moved back in house actually as a lawyer again, I got called from a law school classmate who has his own family office and he needed a tax lawyer. And uh, I went and moved to work for Ziff Brothers Investments for 13 years where I was their tax counsel, but I was also able to cover many legal functions. Again, like this expert generalist Mm skill set. And what I learned from that was I really wanted to work with genuinely good humans. These were genuinely good humans and that's, that's a goal that people should have in their career all the time. Um, and it's not, so- It's not the easiest one though. <laughs> no, it's really difficult, Catherine. It's, it's hard to know who are good people. Yeah. And I feel like that was, that was, uh, that was uh, now had become part of my career goal was mm-hmm. always to work with good humans. Um, I moved out of Ziff Brothers and I knew that I had spent most of my life helping predominantly men on their investments Mm -hmm. and their transactions. And what I really wanted to do and had since law school wanted to do is to work to make the world a better place for women, which sounds like a lofty general goal. But in my case, what I thought was I could use my skill set to help women who are underrepresented in the capital stack for capital raising for entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And so I started um, with two other women at Accelerator Law Firm for women entrepreneurs. And the idea was to help women at the beginning of their learning to raise capital or to start their own businesses with learning some of the, getting some of the legal work done that they needed to get done. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I, at the same time, I realized that I had to pay my mortgage. <laughs> and again, a law school classmate reached out, this one at Herrick and said, we have a tax, uh, a tax position open at Herrick, please come and talk to us. And I said, I tried to talk them out of hiring me, which was <laughs> apparently worked just great. So I said, I have purple hair. I don't own a suit. I don't have any clients. I don't know what you want from me. And they said, no, just come work with us. And so I went to Herrick and actually have been able to work on my <clears throat> assistance to women entrepreneurs there as well. Mm-hmm. There are, I have a great client base. I was able to reestablish my specialty as a tax lawyer. Mm-hmm. I quickly built a book of business. And they really valued my 
expert generalist superpower, right? Because at a mid-sized firm, I think um, you don't really have enough lawyers to be super specialized like you do at a large firm where you have like, even the tax department might be split up into subspecialties. Mm -hmm. At a mid-sized firm, you have to really be able to, to, to take every role that it mm -hmm. comes at you. And so you have to be able to dive in. And so I think it's a kind of an underappreciated advantage to a mid-sized firm is that you get to be general. And that has, you know, it has some really interest. You get really interesting deals that way and interesting clients. Uh, and Herrick, oh, sorry, and Herrick was also excited about my client base, which is mm. single family offices. And so I don't know um, if your listeners are um, up to date with what family offices are, but basically it's the legal work around a wealthy family's investments, operations, philanthropy. And then the issues that come up are actually pretty complicated and complex and uh, they need a lawyer who can uh, be sort of can have the interaction between the per people side and the legal side. All right. One of the interesting things is you kind of are, are documenting the way your career has gone is the way you have a kind of seamlessly gone from legal roles to non-legal ro roles and then back again. Um, what was it like kind of switching those hats? Uh, and, and I guess like switching a hat is such a you know, it's such, such a, such a established cliche, right? Really. But, um, you know, I have to imagine kind of going back again to being a, a lawyer after not having to worry about <laughs> those kind of implications for, for a number of years, um, uh, must've been something, um, that, that was a challenge at the time. And, and how do you sort of, how did you navigate that process? It was really scary, right? It's a <laughs> that, scary that, okay, process. I'm glad because, you said it. I didn't want no, to put totally words in your mouth, but it sounds, it sounds terrifying to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so ter it was terrifying, but I was quiet about that. So, um, <laughs> but I, I feel like when you, have, when you have the ability to look at a problem from different sides, mm -hmm. you are always going to be able to take a step back and see if you, there's something you're missing about it. And one of the things that I know that I'm confident I can do with clients is say, here's what I know, and here's what I need to look up. And I think as long as you're honest about, I know these things, and I'm looking up these things, or I'm going to ask a colleague who knows these things to look them up, you keep, you keep your client's confidence, mm -hmm. and, you, and you also are able to support really learning. And that's how I changed those hats so many times was really by making sure I was doing the work behind the scenes to know what I didn't know and asking experts if I, if I needed to. And um, that credibility is really important. You can't lose that as a lawyer. You have to keep your credibility as being the person who will either say what you know and solve your client's problem or get the answer if you don't. Mm -hmm. And I think that remembering that saying, let me get back to you is an answer. <laughs> and, People and, are fine with that as long as you actually get back to them. Sure, sure. Yeah, <laughs> you, you actually have to do what you're going to say. You say you're going to mm -hmm. do. But that's uh, that's definitely one of the things uh, on, above the law that we've been talking about a lot because there's been a lot of questions about the bar exam, um, especially in this kind of pandemic world and and whether, you know, uh, closed book exams are really test what you need to be a lawyer. And it, it it's always struck me that my time as a lawyer was not characterized by knowing the answer. It's not answering B on, you know, on a multiple choice question, but, but being able to formulate the research questions and answer. And, you know, I was, I was a litigator as an antitrust and, and those are different, those are very different, you know, kinds of law than, than what you've practice, but it seems to me that those fundamental asking questions uh, are really what's key to that lawyer, you know, thinking like a lawyer, that mindset it, more so than any, than knowing any statute or any case law. It's the, it's the questioning process. And Kathy, that's like, you're exactly right. Cause like you were in antitrust where you were working mm -hmm. in and in tax where I work, you have to understand the whole transaction. Mm -hmm. So you, so one of my pet peeves as a tax lawyer, and I'm sure this was also something that you came across in your practice was the corporate lawyers come to you and they're like there are no tax issues in this deal just take a quick look and tell me right. and sign off <laughs> right and I'm like, uh screw you but yeah. then I do it and yeah. then um you fix it if you have to fix it mm -hmm. but just the idea that 
really to know that whole transaction and to get behind what your client's objective is, Mm -hmm. is how you become a good lawyer. Because you can know, then you can then go in and fill in the pieces that you need to, you have to have obviously a base knowledge in your specialty. That's important. You can't fake that, but you can learn where, where the like sort of the very intricate details are that you can go back and look up. Yeah. And it, it also um, seems to me that there's a balancing role that you've you've kind of taken in your career where like you, you kind of just outlined a, a scenario, which I'm sure has happened to you many times in your career where you're asked to kind of parachute in on another department, or another person's deal. Um, but you also have the uh, the desire and need to build your own client base and do your own um, sort of generated works. Uh, can you talk about and, and I think that's a constantly um, sort of a battle that you see in the partnership at law firms of, of pretty much any size, right? Is, you know, who, who do you get if you need someone to service your deals versus somebody who's going to, you know, bring in more clients and be a rainmaker or, and, and sort of the, the push and pull between, you know, making sure that your current client base has the legal expertise that they need uh, with pulling in different clients and more clients and more deals. Uh, and can you kind of talk about that negotiation um, and particularly as, as you know, a partner, which, you know, is very much the brass ring, right? That's, that's what everyone tells you. Good job. Job, you've made it. You're a partner, um, but but you know there's there's it's it's not the end of the discussion. It seems like the beginning of a whole different set of problems and and issues. <laughs> totally, and um, yeah, the, the brass ring was it's interesting because this was never where I expected sure. my career to take me. Back in a law firm, mm-hmm. you know, in um, after being in house for a long time with no client base, right? Mm -hmm. So I came into a law firm, I've quickly built a client base, I'm very Mm -hmm. proud of that. And part of that is because the my natural client base, which is family offices have a wide variety of legal needs. And so Mm -hmm. bringing them in and saying we can work as your outside general counsel and help you with all kinds of legal needs is how I'm building that practice. So the great thing about that is that I can really rely on my other colleagues at Herrick to fill in for the areas that I don't know. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I can be present to cover the specialist tax needs of those other lawyers. And so it's very cooperative, um, Mm -hmm. which I like. And I think the mid-sized firm lends itself to that because you're able to really create relationships with your colleagues in a way that at a larger firm, you might not be able to have as much face-to-face time. The pandemic hasn't helped that, of course, um, but it is really something that I value about the size of the firm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, it seems to me like that kind of also goes back to one of your career goals, which I'm going to steal and give it to anybody who ever asks me for for a career advice is make sure you're working with good humans. And if not, don't be afraid to find somewhere where you think you, there's a better chance of working with good humans. There's good legal work everywhere. Good humans are not everywhere. <laughs> uh, but that also seems like like that goal plays into the ability to form these kinds of working relationships where there really is a balance and, and you know, you work on their clients, they work on your clients, and there's this kind of symbiotic relationship. Um, but, but, you know, that's not always the case. And I know you've been in a lot of um, forms of a lot of areas of the law or the, the finance world, which may be characterized as bro culture. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, like, you absolutely. know, go, I went in-house in finance. I was like, oh, that sounds like that was not fun at all. And yet, and yet <laughs> you've managed to not only survive, you've managed to, to thrive. Uh, what kind of advice do you have for folks that uh, find themselves in that, in a culture that does not suit them? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So I think a few things. One, you have to be able to make space for people in those cultures. And what I was able to do was to find a way to be authentic. Like I was tried to always be true to who I was. And so if I found myself in a space that didn't feel like it was mine, I went and found the space that was mine. So I tried to do that for other people as well in terms of networking and connecting in those spaces and sort of the tech space, the family office space, the investment bank space. There are lots of opportunities to bring women and other sort of diverse groups into the conversation. And I really try to do that. I am always, my door is always open to another woman or student who needs just some advice. 
Mm-hmm. And what I find is most important about that is not looking for an advantage, but just looking to give back. And so if I am called by somebody for networking, I just network and I say, how can I connect you? Can I connect you? I don't, I don't, the work is going to come to me. I've got a skill set. The work comes to me. I don't need, I don't worry about that in terms of marketing. Mm-hmm. I really worry just about helping pay it forward because my path was always paid forward by other people making space for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd also say that I've been very lucky to have worked with a lot of really senior women and the family office world has been a place where women have been able to, like when I was at Ziff Brothers, our chief legal office, our chief, our, our head of HR, our head of trading, our CFO, we're all women. Mm-hmm. And it was really great because we, it just seemed like it was, it was the standard. And I've, um, I think that it's really, um, it, it, the world is changing slowly, um, but it is changing. And I've seen it change during my career. I hope it changes for my kids. And do you think that there, you kind of talked a little bit about your family office work. Um, do you think that there are practice areas in the law that tend to uh, benefit more from diversity? Um, or or do or do we worry that those kinds of, you know, if you say, oh, this kind of work is is women's work, that it, it necessarily creates t- uh, creates this kind of weird self-fulfilling and, and get a wise kind of a mentality about that work. So the sort of, that sort of mentality is something that I've fought against mm-hmm. my whole career. I agree with you. That is a, it's a concern for lots of areas of law. In fact, when I started as a tax lawyer, I thought, Oh, maybe this is a good lifestyle. It, 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 first of all, it wasn't, but also <laughs> like just the mentality that people would pick a practice for the lifestyle means that there's a, there's a problem with the practice, right? Mm-hmm. Because it, it, People shouldn't have to choose their practice based on what they want to do in their lives or who they think they are, how they identify themselves. So I would say um, in terms of that, diversity efforts that I've seen, um, for example, in in the areas that I've worked and the companies that I've worked for, and now in a mid-sized firm, really have to be about the opposite of that, not not siloing, not ghettoizing, Mm -hmm. um, but really letting everybody show up to be their authentic selves each day and bringing along the men. You have to bring the men along because Mm -hmm. if they don't buy into the vision that a more diverse perspective is going to make for better lawyers and better client relationships, nothing will ever change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this podcast is very much built around the idea that a diverse legal profession is yeah. a is a good thing and is something we need to all be working towards. Uh, and obviously, I think that's something that your career um, has been a testament to, sort of the ways in which diversity uh, can help. But how do you currently, and you talked a little bit about it when you're talking about your mentorship um, efforts, but, but how can you use or how can anyone use their position uh, in order to make that space that you talked about? Sure. So, um, I do a lot of work with um, the, my alumni situation here for Cornell. I am the president of the Cornell Law School Women's uh, Association. It's called the Mary Kennedy Brown Society. And we really try to connect alumni to students as much as possible to just, I think law students in particular don't understand the power of reaching out to alumni and getting advice and getting connections. Mm-hmm. So the way I make that space not just in terms of my alumni work, but also in terms of my mentorship of young lawyers or even not young lawyers is to make sure that I'm always available to connect. I think that's our, that's my superpower is connecting people. Mm -hmm. So whether it's clients who need a connection to somebody to work in their company or whether it's, you know, looking for people who are looking for jobs that are either legal or non-legal jobs. That's what I would, that's how I make that space. I just try to connect people. Yeah. And it's, it sounds, it sounds like something you're definitely passionate about. Um, and I just, we're running out of time here, but, um, I just, that's crazy. Yeah, I know it goes really quickly. Doesn't it? Yeah. 
Uh, but, but I, I just want to thank you. And I think that that's some great advice for anybody, um, wanting to inc- take small steps to increase diversity, all these, all these kind of motions to include more folks, uh, you know, has a cumulative effect and, and hopefully has a long-term impact on the profession as well. Well, thank you so much for having me, Catherine. Thank you, Jacqueline, for joining. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, and as long as I'm thanking folks, thank you to our sponsor, PLI. Remember to subscribe to the Jabot on your listening service of choice and give us a rating. Not just the stars, though obviously we'll take them, but a yeah, written review actually helps us move up the algorithm, helps more folks find the podcast. Be sure that you're reading above the law. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Catherine one that's the numeral one. Um, And if you have any suggestions for topics or guests that you'd love to see on the Jabot, you can email us uh, at tips at above the law dot com subject line the Jabot. Thanks again and happy listening.